Hi, everyone. And uh, welcome to the first session of the day. Uh, my name is Anirudh. I lead the big data user group in the Kubernetes community. Uh, the first talk we have today is by Wei Ching Yang from LinkedIn and Jian He from Alibaba. And they're going to be talking about running Apache Samza on Kubernetes. A couple of lo logistical items. Uh, please hold your questions till the end. Uh, I'll come with, to you with a microphone. And uh, leave feedback on sked.com at the end of the session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our talk. I'm Wei Ting from LinkedIn. And I'm working on this Samza on Kubernetes project with Jen. Jen is from Alibaba. And our talk topic today is running Samza on Kubernetes. First, we'll talk about what, Samza, uh, what Apache Samza is. Then we will dive into, dive into its executing a Samza job on Kubernetes. And then we will do a demo to run a Samza job on Azure Kubernetes cluster. After the demo, we will we'll in, uh, talk more about the different deployment options for Samza users. In the end, we will share more practice um, about using Kubernetes as a container, uh, as container uh, framework for other big data processing engines. So Samza is a distributed uh, string processor framework that allows you to build your stateful job uh, that process data at scale in real time. Uh, it was developed at LinkedIn uh, 27, uh, 2013 and was, uh, had been, has been widely used at LinkedIn and other companies like WinWare, Slack, um, uh, Extra. Uh, Samza supports a fully pluggable mode for input sources and output systems. It can process and transfer data from any source. Samza often um, offers built-in integrations with Apache Kafka, ADA, uh, like uh, M AWS Kinesis, Azure Event Hub, and Hadoop, and so on. Also, it's quite easy to integrate uh, with your own sources. There are different development options. You can run Samza in a standalone, standalone mode or in cluster mode. Uh, like run on, run on uh, Apache Yarn or Kubernetes. We'll talk more about the job deployment later. What is a typical Samza use case? Let's look at this picture. Uh, event, event producer, it could be a service, database changes, or metrics. Event producer, Writes the event into messaging systems like Kafka and Azure Event Hub. From where a Samza job reads input events to do the computation. After that, Samza writes job results into output systems, which could be a, a database, REST service, or messaging systems. Then the downstream application can consume the job results to do their own analysis, and so on. <coughs> this slide brings Samza features. Samza provides flexible API in SQL, uh, Java, and Python. It has flexible deployment model for running the applications in any hosting environment, um, and with cluster managers like Young, and Kubernetes. So the same Sanja job code can run everywhere, from public cloud to um, a containerized environment to bare metal hardware. Massive scale. Samza provide the first support for local state and support incremental uh, checkpointing of state instead of full snapshots. Uh, this enables Samza to scale to applications with very large state. Samza support applications um, that use several terabytes of state and runs on thousands of uh, courses. This empowers multiple large companies, including LinkedIn and so on. For tolerance, Samza transparent, um, transparently migrates tasks along with their 
associate state in the event of failures. It supports host affiliate and incremental checkpointing to fast recover of the failures. SAMSA guarantee at least one's processing uh, semantics. Next, we will introduce SAMSA, uh, SAMSA terminology. SAMSA process your data in the form of strings. A string is a, a connect of immutable messages, usually the same type or category. Data in a string can be um, unbounded like a Kafka topic or bounded like a set of files on HDFS. SAMSA supports plugging systems and can, that can implement string abstracts. Uh, for example, Kafka implements the string as a topic, and a while the database can, may implement the string as a sequence of updates to its tables. In this picture, there are two input strings and one output string, and the sensor job filter out the event which are not blue. A string is shorted into multiple partitions for scaling how its data is processed. Each partition is an ordered, replayable sequence of order of records. When a, a message is written into a string, it ends up in one of the partitions. And SAMSA scales your applications by logically breaking it down into multiple partition uh, tasks. A task is a um, unit of parallelism of your um, application. Each task consumes one partition of its input strings. The assignment of partition to task never change. Uh, let's say if a task is on one node that fails, uh, the, task, uh, is uh, the task is restarted elsewhere but still consuming the same string partitions. Just like the uh, logical, uh, just like uh, a task is the logical um, unit of parallelism, and a container is the physical unit. An uh, application typically have multiple containers uh, distributed across hosts. You can think of each container as a GVM process, which runs one or more tasks. So each application also has a job coordinator, which manages, which, which manages the assignment of tasks across the individual containers. The coordinator monitors the liveness of individual containers and redistributes the task among the remaining ones, remaining ones during a failure. The coordinator itself is pluggable. So this enables, this enables SAMSA to support multiple de deployment options. As we know, Kubernetes supports long-running jobs well, and SAMSA is a string processing framework, and its jobs are long-running jobs. So Kubernetes is a good, another good option for SAMSA users to deploy their jobs. Uh, we integrate uh, SAMSA with Kubernetes for running streaming processing as a, ma a managed service. We leverage Kubernetes for isolation, multi-tenancy, resource management, and deployment for SAMSA application. In this mode, you write your SAMSA application and submit to scheduled on a Kubernetes cluster. SAMSA then work with Kubernetes to provision resources for your application and run it across a cluster of machines. It also handles the failure of individual instances and automatically restart them. We will dive into how a SAMSA job runs on Kubernetes. First, let's recap a bit of Kubernetes. The master components includes API server, controller, scheduler. A scheduler was newly created pods and select one node for them to run on. For controller, Kubernetes strips building controllers like a stateful set. User, users can also develop their own controllers. For slave node component, it includes Kubernetes and pod. 
Kubernetes is an agent to launch and manage the life cycle of the pod. Let's talk about the workflow of a center job running on the Kubernetes. So first, the, job, the user used the run app script to submit their job. The script will initialize an application runner, which is the main entry point responsible for running center application. The application runner parses your com configs and writes them to a Kafka topic for distributing them. Then it process, it proceeds to submit a request to an uh, API server to launch a job coordinator pod. The Kubernetes will start the job coordinator pod. The, coordinate, the job coordinator is then responsible for uh, managing the overall application. It reads configs from the Kafka and computes work assignment for individual pods. It also determines the host each pod should run on, taking data locality into account. It proceeds to send worker pod creation requests to API server. The Kubernetes will watch the requests and start the worker pods. If the application's dependency are hosted in the remote artifactory repository, like HDFS, those dependencies need to be downloaded into the pods. So in step eight, the worker will ask the job coordinator for its assigned tasks. Let's look at more about the st step eight. When the worker pod is started, it first queries the, uh, query the job coordinator for its work assignment and configs. Then it proceeds to execute its assigned tasks. In this picture, the job has two input string, which has four partitions repass, uh, respectively. Each worker has its own assigned string partitions, which then can read inputs from. Let's look at more about, uh, let's look at into the node. Kubernetes will start a container and then continuously watch the house of the container. It then restart container if the container fails. The container can be configured to write state into local or remote store. If it's configured to the remote, a remote store will be mounted into the pod. For the case in the example in the picture, the Azure remote store is mounted into the pod. Next, we'll do a demo. How to run a standard job on AKS cluster. In the cluster, besides Kubernetes, we also deploy Kafka. The job will write the result into Kafka. What is the job is doing is to read real-time feeds from Wikipedia, extract the metadata of the events, and calculate the count every 10 seconds for all edits that, are, that were made during that window. It outputs the counts uh, into a Kafka topic called Wikipedia state topic. Let's look at the demo. I'm going to run a center job called Wikipedia application in AKS. This is the Azure portal. I've created an AKS cluster. There are the resources, disks, two storage account, and three virtual machines. To use Azure file as a Kubernetes volume, we need to create a storage account and a file share for it. So the Sansa storage account is for that. The other storage account is used to process the files for Cloud Shell. Let's look at the Sansa storage account. This is the file share I created. Now, here, there is no file here. We'll go back to here after we run the job. Let's open the shell to run the job. First, let's look at the services running in the cluster. 
In the cluster besides Kubernetes, we also deployed Kafka because the job used Kafka as the messaging system. Let's check the namespace. Besides default namespace, we created Samza namespace for running Samza jobs. We can see here, there is no Samza job running in the cluster as there's no pods in Samza namespace. In default namespace, there is a pod called Kafka client. We'll log into it to run our job. Before running the job, let's check the existing Kafka topics. This is the command to list the Kafka topics. For a Wikipedia application job, the job results will be sent to a Kafka topic called Wikipedia states. And now we can see there's no such topic created. We can submit a Samza job using the run app script. We need to provide two parameters to the script. One is the config location, and the other is a factory class that's used to read the configuration file. Out of the box, Samza ships with the pro property config factory, but you can also implement your own config factory as well. Before running the job, let's look at what configurations we set up in the configuration file. This is the configuration file. Since we want to run the job on Kubernetes, we set up these two configurations to tell Samza to choose Kubernetes operator to run the jobs instead of other cluster managers like Yum. We also set up the application class application name and ID, job partition number, container account, and the base directory of the log and job state files. These two configurations are related to Kafka system. We also specify the image name for the job and the namespace where the job runs. This config is to enable the job to use Azure files as the Kubernetes volume. Other configurations are related to key value store, serializers, and the job metrics. Let's go back to Cloud Shell to run the job. OK, the job has been submitted to AKS successfully. Let's check the job status. Now we can see there are three pods created by the job. One is the job coordinator pod. This is the job coordinator pod. And the other two are worker pods. Their status is running. We can check pod status in dashboard as well. Let's switch to Samza namespace. We can see the CPU usage, memory usage. Also, we can see the pod information and PV claims. Until now, there's no errors or exceptions showing in the dashboard. Everything looks, everything looks okay. Everything looks fine. We can log into the containers to check the job state and logs. Let's log into one of the worker containers.
Let's check if the log file and the state folder have created successfully or not. Okay, we can see the log files and the state folder. Now let's check the job results. We log back to the Kafka client part. We check the Kafka topic again. We can see there are some topics created by the job, the coordinate string, change log string, and some intermediate strings. Job results are saved into the Kafka topic, Wikipedia states. We can use, we can use this command to read the messages from the result topic. Now we can see there have been some results already. Okay. If the container is gone, the files saved in the container will also gone. To check the job state and logs, after the container gone, we can check them in Agile file. Because before running the job, we configure the job to use Agile file as the remote volume mounted into the pod. The data in Agile file will always be there, no matter whether the job or container is gone or not. Let's go back to the Agile file and check the logs and state files. Now we can see there are the job logs and state files. This is, this is the folder for the job, job coordinator part. The other two are for the worker container. There are the logs and the job states. That's all of the demo. Next, um, Jen will talk about the different deployment options. Hello. Yeah, so uh, I'll talk about uh, the other deployment options for Samza. Uh, that is either running standalone or running on Hadoop Yarn. And also, I, I'll briefly mention uh, how Kubernetes, Kubernetes works for other data processing engines like Spark, Flink. Uh, first, uh, the standalone mode of sensor. Uh, so uh, in the previous uh, part, we mentioned that Samsung works on Kubernetes, and Samsung has also has, has a way to run statically on the host, meaning the user can simply start the sensor uh, stream processor manually on the bare host. And in this mode, so all the stream processors uh, uses the uh, zookeeper for communication. So basically, it uses the zookeeper for membership management and task coordination. So in contrast, in this mode, it does not use uh, Kubernetes or YAM for scheduling. So there will be limitations, like if one node fails, uh, sensor stream pro processor cannot automatically fail to a different fail over to a different node. So there will be some limitations in this mode. Uh, so, uh, and that's another mode that Samza runs on YARN. So in this mode, Samza leverages YARN for scheduling and resource management and deployment. So YARN is very similar. Uh, architecture level is similar to Kubernetes. Uh, it's also a master slave uh, architecture. Uh, that YARN uh, has a master called the resource manager, uh, the IAM. So that is similar to the API server and scheduler of the Kubernetes. It is responsible for uh, scheduling the containers across the clusters. And the slave is the node manager that is similar to the role of Kubernetes in Kubernetes. And it's responsible for 
launching the containers. And also, there's an application master that is similar to the controller, the operator concept in Kubernetes. So the application master is basically a piece of user, uh, user retained code for user to interaction, uh, interact with Yarn and start their containers. The way it works is, so the Samza Yarn client first talks to the resource manager. It submits the Spark, uh, sorry, the Samza application and then the resource manager will make decisions and scheduling the SAMHSA, uh, the SAMHSA application master to a particular node. So once the SAMHSA application master is started, it goes back talking to the resource manager and ask him for containers to launch the SAMHSA tasks. So the SAMHSA tasks is a real task that's running inside the container. So once the SAMHSA tasks is started on the node manager, then uh, it can start with its own business logic, like reading data from the Kafka broker. Uh, if we do a comparison between Kubernetes and Yarn, uh, so Kubernetes is uh, historically good for long running service, uh, as people know. So uh, the design of Kubernetes uh, is what we also call the level trigger design. Uh, the way it works is user specify uh, the intent in the form like a YAML file. So it specifies the intent, what is the state, what, the, what is the expected state of my app. And then the operator or the controller running on Kubernetes, it will try to drive the current state of the cluster towards the desired state. Uh, say example, if we deploy an app with five replicas, and the cluster has only, say, uh, three replicas, it will try to match up the two remaining ones. And if it's more than that, it will automatically delete the extra ones. So it's always trying to match the current state towards the desired state. And that's how uh, the Kubernetes, the controller, the operator works uh, in, uh, in code. So it always does this control loop. Every period of all the time, it checks the current state and the desired state. So this sort of creates a self-healing mechanism. Uh, so like uh, eventually, the system will somehow uh, go back to the original track. So it leverages such loop uh, design patterns. Uh, it's ideal for automated daily operations. So people can simply say what, my application, what state I want my application to be. And then the controller operator will go towards that state. So in contrast, the YARN is not, it's not like that. So YARN is uh, mostly known for big data processing uh, engines. So it, it's a platform for scheduling uh, data processing engines like Spark, MapReduce, uh, and so on. So it's known good for uh, batch jobs. And YARN has this uh, first class job concept. Uh, things like it builds features for uh, job priority. So it can schedule in based on job, uh, the, the job level. And, and uh, they are, they are the, the scheduling part of YARN is also, I think it's more, uh, more feature uh, extensive than Kubernetes. It builds a lot of scheduling advanced uh, features there. So, but in contrast, the Kubernetes uh, scheduling is mostly based on pod level. So it's scheduled based on pod. So there are some uh, difference between Yarn and Kubernetes. Uh, other than that, we, uh, so we all talk about some, how Kubernetes works for other data processing engines like Spark and Flink. So first Spark. Spark is uh, in here, it's very similar to what we just said. How Spark works on Kubernetes is that Spark still, uh, it also has the, driver and the executor. So the driver is, is pretty much similar to the same job coordinator. It's the central component for uh, coordinating the tasks across the clusters. And the executor is a real, uh, the real worker that's similar to the sensor worker. And the, the client first submits the, the driver port. And the, the driver port, once the driver port started, 
it will go back to the Kubernetes API server and create its own uh, executor ports. So once all these ports started, uh, cl uh, Spark cluster is formed. Uh, so that's how Spark works to, uh, with the Kubernetes. And there's another thing community built uh, that's called the Spark operator. So the Spark operator, it leverages the operator concept in Kubernetes, uh, as I mentioned. So operator in Kubernetes is, is, a, is, a, is a way for user to specify their application in a declarative form. So say in a form of a YAML file, and user submits the YAML file to, to the cluster, and the operator will watch the YAML file definition and tries to create uh, uh, or delete uh, certain ports to match the YAML file definition. So here, uh, similarly, Spark wrote its own uh, Spark operator that the user can submit the Spark defin application definition through the CLI, and the Spark operator watch that definition file and do uh, whatever it needs, like create the driver ports, create, and the driver ports then in turn create the executor ports. And also the operator monitors the port status and tries to set the application status based on uh, certain port status. So this whole thing is very similar to uh, the well-known controllers on Kubernetes, such as stable set deployment and so on. So the YAML file of Spark operator looks like this. Uh, it's, it shows the spec and the status. The spec is the, uh, is the specification of the Spark application. Uh, inside it, it specifies things like uh, uh, the driver and the executors, how, what is the mem memory sizing, the cost limits, and so on for the Spark, and also the image. Uh, what is the image for the application, and also the things like the class name of the Spark app. And the status side, it shows the status of the app and other information like uh, the, uh, the web UI address and so on. So that's how Spark works on Kubernetes. And in, so Kubernetes also uh, integrate integra with uh, Flink. So the Flink is another popular very popular streaming processing engines. And Flink architecture-wise, it's also uh, kind of like a master-slave. So the Flink has the job manager that's similar to the SAMHSA job coordinator. And also the task manager that's similar to the SAMHSA worker. So uh, uh, in Flink, it, it actually uses the Kubernetes deployment primitive to launch its own job managers and task managers. So it does not, it's not embedded in the Flink framework as, uh, up to this time. So the pros of this approach is that it uh, leverages the existing robust Kubernetes workload primitives. And this requires minimum code changes. But the disadvantage of that is it's not as flexible as the Samza Spark approach. So in the below examples, uh, the job, so the left side shows the YAML definition for the job manager. That's the deployment, that uses the deployment uh, primitive in Kubernetes to, to deploy one instance of the Fink job manager. And the right side shows the deployment YAML file for a uh, user to deploy uh, two replicas of task managers. So with this way, uh, the Flink uh, leverages the uh, deployment to launch the instances. However, uh, so uh, co in, uh, in contrast with the previous uh, mechanism, uh, in this mode, uh, it has limitations like uh, it cannot say, I want to run a pod on a particular node uh, with data locality considered. So it completely leverages the underlying uh, uh, controller primitives. So it has such limitations. So the, the control uh, primitive code is hard coded, so you can't easily change it. So uh, that's one thing. And yeah, so that's it. It concludes our session. Thank you. <laughs>